before we get into a very heavy interview all about the Black Legend, which I'm very excited for you to go over with us today. So if you would please just kind of tell us who you are, your name, what your account on YouTube and Instagram portrays really, and what you do. Hi, uh, I'm Zacarias uh, from Hispanidad Translations, and uh, yeah, I'm from Sacramento, California. And uh, so uh, I've dedicated a lot of uh, my time and, and work to translating um, Spanish arguments and lessons uh, into English uh, with a lot of details that don't, in some cases, don't even exist in English um, or they've kind of been skipped over. So, yeah, that's uh, basically what I do. So I work with a lot of authors, archaeologists, um, influencers, uh, historians. So. Yes, that's bas that's basically what I do. On and uh, but yeah, I appreciate you having me here, Jamie. Awesome. Well, happy to have you. All right, so let's just go ahead and get into it. So, what is the Black Legend, and how does it manifest in American history today? So, uh, I personally, I like to define the Spanish Black Legend kind of like this. Um, the Spanish Black Legend is uh, they are slanderous distortions. Uh, regarding Hispanic history uh, based on exaggerations or false propaganda. Um, so anyways, in regards to, so that's just uh, the definition, uh, just uh, what these distortions have come about due to cultural wars and actual wars in history. Uh, his, then in regards to American history, and if we want to get more specific to United States history, um, I would say uh, Hispanic Catholics have pioneered and they've been a motor in this country, in the United States, for generations, uh, even more than 100 years before the pilgrims arrived on the Mayflower. Uh, many parts of the United States, like the first cities, including the first capital in New Mexico, the first maps and the first expeditions um, by, by Europeans uh, of the Southwest, uh, were from Hispanic Catholics. And uh, mm -hmm. the first introductions to the Christian faith, uh, to the local population, were by Hispanic Catholics. The first native languages that were recorded, the first native people that were recorded um, through writing, and uh, at least into to into the West, um, they were by Hispanic Catholics. And uh, the first proto industries like animal husbandry of cattle and horses, the mining, uh, first mixed marriages, and first uh, free city of blacks. The fr first free city of blacks in Florida was uh, Fort May Mose was uh, by the um, by the Spanish Empire. Um, this was all happening before the United States was the, before the United States was the country it is now, uh, and the list goes on and on. There are a lot of feats and accomplishments and and low and high moments. <clears throat> Although these powerful uh, milestones, they're, they're either not celebrated or they're just completely unknown. Uh, for example, uh, in regards to the United States history, uh, Catholic Spain helped the thirteen colonies gain their independence uh, by providing ammunition. Uh, cannons, uh, soldiers, uniforms, money, and intel, um, especially in the South. And uh, <clears throat> generals, there were generals, uh, very important generals, like uh, Jeronimo, Giron, and Moctezuma. Uh, Moctezuma uh, being, he was a descendant of the, the Moctezuma lineage, lineage mm -hmm. uh, whose lineage did not die after the fall of the Tenochtitlan, after the Aztec Empire fell. Uh, in fact, uh, Hernan Cortes uh, uh, adopted his children and made them nobles into Spanish society. And um, wow. yes, and there's many other uh, de there are many other descendants that still exist to this day in Mexico and in Spain, and they still carry those noble titles. And so, anyways, one of these uh, these uh, these descendants became a general in uh, for the independence of the United States, uh, Jerónimo Gironi Moctezuma, and uh, Bernardo de Galvez is another great general. Um, these were war heroes, and um, they were Hispanic, Spanish-speaking Catholics. Um, so much so that uh, Thomas Jefferson recognized Bernardo de Galvez in his letter uh, when he wrote, um, he wrote him, and I quote, So the weight of your powerful, the weight of your powerful and wealthy empire has given us all the certainty of a happy issue to the present contest. And then, and George Washington also stated, um, when he told Major General John Sullivan in 1779, uh, Spain has at length taken a decisive part. It is to be hoped that this formidable junction of the House of Bourbon, the Bourbones were, was, the, was the royalty 
the, the like the royal family of of Spain at that moment. Okay. Um, I will not fail of establishing the independence of America in a short time. And Thomas Jefferson continued later on in his letter to Thomas Mann Randolph in 1787. Spanish is the most important to an American. Our connection with Spain is already most important. No, is already. Well, I don't know. let me get this right. Spanish is most important to an American. Our connections with Spain is already important and will become daily more so. Besides this, the ancient part of American history is written chiefly in Spanish. Wait a minute. And, uh, George Washington said that? This is uh, Thomas Jefferson that said this Thomas part. Thomas Jefferson. Yes. You know, uh -huh. I don't remember learning that in school. No, we hear about the French, right, in school helping the United States, but we never heard about the Spanish helping the United States. And I think a lot of it's, I would say, the cultural tensions, right, between Hispanic Catholics and WASP, maybe. But, um, but yeah, yeah, there was a lot of... There was a lot of help there, but um. Anyways, uh, beside uh, and then anyways, uh, as I'll continue on, like um, uh, it's not like you know the Hispanics weren't. Yeah, they have always been around. Um, and so, uh, many veterans, uh, like my grandfather and my great uncles, they fought in World War Two. Um, they fought, and there's been uh, many Hispanics in all the major battles, especially in the 20th century. Um. The Catholics and Hispanics have been helping uh, build this country from the very start. And uh, the United States, uh, yeah, is, is with its greatest global accomplishments, uh, have uh, relied heavily on, um, on, this, on this group of people uh, helping as well. So along with many others. <clears throat> but anyways, yeah, <clears throat> that's pretty much Okay. That's pretty much what I have to say about that. <laughs> we got a lot going on in the conversation. Can you see the conversation? Okay. Mm -mm. No. I'm not, I'm not looking at it. <laughs> John says that you're up early. I am up early. And it's but I'm ready. Huh? <laughs> and it's because I, we don't know what that we were taught the Anglo version in school. Yeah, I guess so. So mentioning school, so like how do we place how do we place this with like the Spanish Inquisition? Oh yeah. Yeah, one moment. One moment. Well, <clears throat> let me see here. One, I'm sorry. Pulling up moment. the chat. Yeah, I'm trying to pull up my notes. Hold on a second. One second. Hey, Matt. Glad you guys are on. Thanks for being here, guys. Keeping us company. While he pulls that up, I'm drinking my hibiscus tea. Got to lower that blood pressure, you know. <laughs> Y'all are going crazy in the comments. That's funny. Thanks, babe. I think Carlos froze. We're gonna see if he comes back. No, no, I'm I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, okay. I'm just getting my notes up real quick. I can hear you oh, still no too. Problem. So hold on. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. All right, guys. So you can still hear us. So let's not talk about him too much, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm sorry. I wish I had these notes up beforehand. I'm, oh, there it is. Okay. I'm a little, just a little early. It's a little harder to get prepared. No like, problem. Counts out the bed. It's what, 7 o'clock right. where you are? Yeah. I'm usually, I'm pretty, I'm an early bird, but this is, you know, it's heavy stuff. I'm used to, but uh, anyways, I just want to make sure, you know, I do it right. No um, problem. So, so you asked about the Spanish Black Legion. Okay. Okay. So I think 
what number one when I talk to Americans? Hispanic. Yeah, I'm, I'm United States Americans. I like to let them know that uh, the Inquisition in the Americas had very little activity. I mean, obviously that, you know, any activity of an Inquisition uh, in our time seems like, you know, too much. But um, that is something to consider. Um, they should, I, the reality of life was different in the Americas uh, in, in that regards because the religious wars were really on fire in Europe um, where they were happening. Uh, the people, the people who know the least about the subject, though, are some of the loudest voices. Ironically, um, there are trolls and there are activists alike, uh, with no evidence, uh, make heavy accusations of high death counts and torture methods, uh, complete exaggerations. In reality, what they incredible feats and evangel evangelization of America by simply stating, by oversimplifying, that everyone was violently forced to become Catholic. Uh, this was never the strategy of the church or the crown. In fact, what these same people fail to mention is that in 300 years, there were only uh, four Native Americans who had, who had died uh, by issued by the Spanish Inquisition. Um, and, and that was almost immediately in the very, very, very. And from this came uh, an outcry by Spanish Catholics who said um, that these these folks weren't um, they weren't formed in the faith or they weren't formed in this th this philosophy uh like m like uh, other rivals of the other opponents of the faith were or who would, or maybe i would say not opponents but gentiles were yeah. uh like either like muslims or jewish people or protestants um that these these uh people need to be protected from the inquisition and so native americans were prohibited from the spanish inquisition um for 300 years and so um that part gets le left out yeah, ironically, you know, um, <clears throat> so much so that mestizo people mix kind of. Um, there were times when they were called by this Inquisition, and they would they would call upon their indigenous side, and like I can't be uh, called upon and talk, asked about this, you know, like I don't got the time for this. Um, anyways, the Inquisition mostly judged, uh, mostly judged. Uh, most Europeans or mestizos in the Americas, uh, like whites, uh, mixed with white um, in the Americas. Of the three inquisitorial courts in the Americas, uh, Mexico's court issued the most deaths, and it, and it didn't even surpass 150 people in 300 years. Hmm. Um, again, that's, we talk about, you know, yes, I would rather nobody had died by an inquisition, but, you know, 150, you know, you can kind of see then 300 years, um, kind of how little the activity is here, yeah. uh, compared to other, yeah, <laughs> compared to other inquisitions, which were not legislatively protected. Uh, I'm talking about in Protestant Europe and especially Pro Protestant Germany, which became Europe's cremor witch cremoratory. Um, and, um, they, and in Germany, Protestant Europe, Germany, they killed out 25,000 witches, um, some some think uh, it could be even more. There are other estimates, other historians who believe it. Some say even fifty thousand, but uh, I like to go with a more conservative number to uh, to avoid any issues with credibility. But but it's very very high. Uh, Twenty five thousand people in this time period. Also, um, Protestant Germany was set back into a, a very heavy um, into a, a heavy poverty, a very strong feudalistic system until it reached the industrial era. Thanks to in the south um and that's why we have cities like uh munich i can't even pronounce the name but in in bavaria who is a very is a motor of the country um and uh yeah that part gets conveniently left out too but um <clears throat> uh the spanish inquisition in total issued in total in this history issued uh, uh deaths of three thousand uh people um and this is according to the historian heinrich common and many other historians and and all the other, all the other historians, the realistic ones, don't have the numbers going past five thousand people in three hundred years. Um, therefore, these numbers are not as high, and they're not as exaggerated as rivals or opponents of Spain or Catholics would have you believe. Um, I remember I talked to a nurse one time, and I don't know how this came up, but I remember she was saying numbers like, "Oh, they killed like hundreds of thousands of you know people, you know everybody." Yeah. You know, so like they made people they they didn't make they they challenged people who dared to believe and dare to dream the Inquisition and the, and not not quite you know this was these were heavily religious matters 
and um, and then this this time sparked a renaissance in, Span in not just you know Spanish society in the world where her Hispanic Catholics were developed, were pioneering and engineering um, their engineer and they're, um, they're d dominating the seas um, they're building cities uh, they're, yeah there was a lot going on um, but when we think of the we think of the Renaissance we don't think of you know inquisitorial Spain we think more of like Leonardo da Vinci's Italy or France right. France mm -hmm. um, so a lot of but a lot of intelligent people came out of this time period and uh, one, and uh, I think that and one of them to go to talk about too would be the uh, human rights the human rights uh, the buds of human rights like the buds of uh, it becoming a popular topic in a global scale comes from this time period you know we're, when we see in the University of Salamanca we see the defense of the native people uh, really being put on display for the crown and different opinions going back and forth and and I think that's a very telling sign for the society that there was so much challenge to the king so much challenge to what was going on to elites and nobles that this kind of conversation was open and available to be had right it's very telling that it was not a it was not a um a restrictive model right that we're told about Catholic Spain anyways to continue with the Spanish Inquisition um uh, torture it, it did happen and uh and it existed uh to root out confessions uh, but not lives but again inquisitorial torture has been exaggerated and even lied about uh the Spanish Inquisition museums and there are these museums in Hispanic America and in Spain as well ironically um but the these museums they these torture in instruments there that were never used in the inquisitions in any of the spanish inquisitions uh in fact i made a video i made two videos on this subject i made one specifically on these gruesome instruments some of these gruesome instruments and what their origin origins really came from and uh like some of them are like for example from ones from like the iron maiden is one for example it's, it's actually from germany and it didn't even it didn't even exist until like the 1900s. I mean, I'm sorry, the 1800s, the 19th century, and uh, and I remember the uh, the first one was actually blown up during World War II. Um, but these Iron Maidens are in these inquisitorial muse museums, and uh, they have these all these all these other types of instruments. Um, you these stone crushers. You know, you have um, the pair of anguish. Uh, uh, you have all uh, the chassis belts, for example. Yeah. Um, and that's a complete falsehood, right? That never was used. Um, these are all, these, a lot of these come from like the 1800s. And uh, during what would they say in, Span in Spanish, I don't know if, what the name is in English, but in Spanish they call it like this, um, the Romantic period. It's kind of a, an odd an odd time period that I haven't really, I haven't really studied much in English, but I've seen a lot in Spanish. So I wouldn't know the appropriate name for it. Yeah. Um, and I see this style, right, is kind of being produced through that time. So anyways, going back to what I was saying before. Um, so, uh, but why are they there, right? If these things are so faked and it's a museum that's supposed to be historically credible, why are these instruments in there in the first right. place, right? Yeah. Wouldn't somebody know better, right? Right. Well, it's, obvious, it's to make money. They make money off of it. And uh, these museums, have they've lost so much historical credibility that they don't even hide it anymore. Um, it's up to the visitor to realize these places are more like amusement parks uh, than a museum. Uh. And so, you know, some of, some of the stuff's very outlandish. Uh, I mean, uh, some of the stuff's like, you have like, some you have images of like, um, I don't know, just like beasts and yeah, just things that it's like almost like a scary, like a like a horror house, right? Like a horror house, yeah. right? You know, like house of horrors, house of horrors, let's just say. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so. Anyways, um, according to the to the Manual de Procedimiento, uh, the procedural manual uh, was a guideline for the inquisitor. You know, a manual. So they, as Catholics do, right? There's everything's very legislative, right? So um, the Inquisition was, had a lot of legislation surrounding it, um, the do's and don'ts, right? <clears throat> What's um, and so this the Spanish Inquisition only permitted three types of torture. Um, these these were el potro, uh, la y la garrucha, and uh, each, any torture session was prohibited to go to not go past an hour and a half. Um, every inquisition was required to have uh, diligent note takers, so secretaries, mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, they even recorded they recorded everything. And, and this is actually very common in, in uh, Hispanic America too um, during the Vice Regal period uh, when they're building when they're building cities and and, and coming across things, ex- exploring places that um, it it's for for these these Spanish Catholics recording was just as important as ammunition. I mean, it's it, everything was written about. Even even telling on other people, right, was written about. Um, and so every every Inquisition was required to have diligent note takers. Yeah, um, they even to the point where they even recorded what pe- sound people's people made when if they were tortured or if they were tortured, right? Um, and a medical doctor was required to avoid permanent damage. Uh, so the Spanish Inquisition was also the uh, upon penance and corrections. Uh, the conditions were also much better than civil courts, both in Spain and in, and especially in other places of the world at that time. Uh, so so much so that criminals would blaspheme, so they would they would get into the, to the inquisitorial their jails, and and uh, because they they realized that they could they'd be better off in an inquisitorial jail. Right. But yeah, that's I'll leave it at that for the Spanish Inquisition and just kind of clarifying some some details about it. Yeah, thank you. I know, guys, we're going through like some really deep stuff here, and it's like a lot to consume, but I really appreciate Mm -hmm. you doing it for us. Okay, so if the Black Legend was like this exaggerated distortion of Spanish history, then what is the White Legend? Because I've heard of that too. Yeah, so the White Legend... Um, is also known as the pink legend in Spanish. They call it uh, La Leyenda Rosa. And in my Spanish-speaking circles, it's like kind of frowned upon to be um, to be associated with the white legend, and uh, oh. and it, because it hurts credibility, right? Uh, people don't, they don't, everyone, and I think Hispanics like myself. That's what I, that's why I kind of you know, we. There's people who are Hispanics, like defenders of our Hispanic heritage, right? Um, we. We are we. I, a lot of them are. They don't follow the white legend um, because, for that very reason, right? We don't we don't dive into exaggerations. So, anyways, I should find it. So, I'm sorry. I would say the Spanish white legend is a series of romanticized distortions regarding Hispanic history, also based on exaggerations, but on legends. And so, that's what it is. So, it's basically like um, a dolled up side of history, right? Just over, over romanticized. Um, which is also not realistic. You know, nothing's perfect. So you don't prefer the white legend? No, no, I, I don't. I don't prefer anything that that isn't true. Uh, the white legend is problematic because it hurts our historical credibility. Uh, however, it must be said. It must be said that the white legend in our academic and popular settings does not have the same traction as the black legend. And what does this mean? This means that the black legend is more widely believed and is accepted without challenge, more so than people would, more so than, than the black legend. Oh. Uh, for example, if I were to say Hernan, Hernan Cortes was a charitable philanthropist, people would laugh in my face uh, because that is a white legend. Oh. If I were to say the opposite, if I were to say the opposite, which would be uh, Hernan Cortes was a genocidal racist, the same people would applaud, but it's... It's just as false. Right. As you probably already can see, when reviewing Catholic church history, there are black legends there too, um, which kind of drew my attention to this kind of work because it was, I, see, I saw the parallels here. And I was like, wow, they like, kind of like how people kind of slander us for being idol worshipers without, without cause, without, and without remorse. And after hearing the truth, they'll still do it. And it gets pushed into the people's memory as if it was true. I right. see the same kind of behavior and attitudes going toward Hispanic history too, in many other circumstances. And so, these black legends are so widely acceptable that anything challenging these distortions seem like a white legend. When right. that's how that's how far our society has dropped from historical academic rigor. Right. <clears throat> These legends oversimplify a complex era with many great and low moments, whether it's the Spanish Inquisition, the Spanish presence in the discovered lands, the diseases, and Hispanic Catholic acculturation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. There's a lot. There's a lot I debunk. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. 
Oh, sorry. No problem. So, you know, I, I, I see, I've seen both, you know, the black legend, the white legend, you know, so who defends the white legend then? And what kind of impact does it have or did it have? Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who may deny uh, all the negative experiences of the past, someone who oversimplifies history as some happy Arcadia, like a paradise, right? And uh, was a, um, like, like the paradise of Adam and Eve almost, right? Um, whether it's Hispanic or not, right. whether it's Spanish or not, uh, I see the white legend as a naive view of the world. But ironically, I don't see that many Catholic Hispanics like myself take that, take that bait. Even though there do exist some sensationalists, um, yeah. and I've seen them, they exist, uh, like there is in every group. Um, but it's for me, it's more alarming how many people are willing to believe the white legend of Native America before the arrival of the Spanish. To mm. me, to many people, there are too many people who really believe that America was a paradise with abundance, no disease, no starvation, no war. Right. When the Americas was a hectic place where machismo, meaning the man being in charge, and human sacrifice and cannibalism preyed on weaker groups. Right. This was not exclusive to the Aztec Empire, the Mexica Empire, what, how it's really called. Uh, these practices extended through by Spanish Catholics. The archaeology, the science confirms what the first Spanish speakers in the Americas were recording, were recording. Yet I have seen activists try and deny these facts, just like Holocaust deniers. Hmm. Yeah, that's sad. So let's let's go back to the black legend. Um, the black legend's impact on Spain's cultural image, <clears throat> as well as the image of Roman Catholics. So the, it impacts Spain's cultural image as well as the image of Roman Catholics. Would you agree to that? If so, would you elaborate? Of course. How does connection? Can you still hear me? I can hear pretty well. You're here? breaking up a little bit, but we can still get what you're saying. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Sized Catholics. Finger pointing and has hurt the world because these exported black legend ideas language and most importantly their faith. Wow. All right, so um, being a college student, I'm gonna get a little controversial because I love to see both sides of things, you know, to kind of give our viewers and even us like, you know, just a different perspective on something, okay? Kind of like when you mentioned there's always that sensationalist, right, in those groups. So on a controversial note, I'm going to try not to butcher her name. If I do, correct me, okay? Eleanor Villarubia is an author who believes that Spain's Inquisition is a positive thing because it led to more people converting to Catholicism. She quoted, to be Spanish was to be Catholic. For her, the Spanish Inquisition <laughs> was a positive event in history because it held like the religious significance and religious matters triumphs all else. So while it's called the white legend, not all supporters seek to dispel the black legend as a stain but rather to embrace it as a good thing. I would like to know what are your thoughts on this statement and do you agree with her? Christians were at risk of being trafficked and killed for their faith. The, the Reconquista was carried out by Christian kingdoms of the peninsula, joining forces and expelling the Moors and their government. 
an, Islam an Islamic government in southern Spain that was not religiously tolerant, was not a religiously tolerant par paradise, uh, another white legend myth. Upon ending the war and reconquering the Iberian Peninsula, we see the expulsion of non-Catholics, so mainly Jewish and Muslims. I understand why Muslims were expelled due to the ongoing fighting, and the Jewish people were expelled from many countries like England and Germany and France, all throughout Europe, before and after this expulsion. Another black legend myth is that Spain was exceptionally the only place that did this. No. If anything, Spain was the only one that let these families keep their wealth or convert. They were also late in the eyes of other European powers. And I, mean, I mean, we see records of other countries uh, stressing and pressuring um, mm -hmm. Spain having uh, Jewish people in their country and calling them, even calling them pigs. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, suspicion arose and some of these new Christians were being accused of not being faithful Christians, basically accused of practicing their old faith. That is why the Inquisition would get involved to repel mob justice and legalize these matters. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to say that since I didn't live in this time, through this time, if I were to be asked right now to start an Inquisition and bring it back, I would say no. Right. <laughs> I would have to say no. I, uh, but I can't judge that time given their experiences and realities, which required much stricter measures for survival and unity. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> So, okay, so I saw in one of your recent posts on Instagram that there was a book published to investigate the history of WASP, and mm -hmm. let me define that real quick in case people don't know. WASP are the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and their obsession with racial supremacy regarding how Spanish people are treated in the United States. Was this book introducing racism against white people or does it confront anti-Catholic, um, you know, propaganda given that WASP were Protestants? So this is important. This comes up a lot on my channel. Uh, I have my, my beloved uh, white Catholic Americans and then I have my beloved uh, Mexican Americans, and then I have my everyone's Catholic mostly, right? And the right. or they're you know, but they they get a little tripped out because sometimes I have to call history, right, and um, call it out what happened. And so, unfortunately, in our country, as an American, we have been engineered by racists and anti-racists uh, to see everything in black and white. Yeah. Therefore, my content that is translated from other academics sometimes gets misconstrued by American Hispanics and English speakers as defending whites or attacking whites, when in reality it's not doing any of that. When I talk about racism or genocide by the United States, it's not an attack on all white people. Genocide and racism is not limited only to white people. Right. In fact, some Hispanics are white. In fact, some Hispanics are white. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I talk to people, some of these people in Spain look like they look like you. <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the truth. So th it's not a uh, racially charged talk. It's it's the history that's just, it, it's how we, we have a way of seeing things that's a little off, us Americans. And it's right. everything is like, we're all in two different groups. Like it's us versus them, it's us versus them. Yeah, yeah. It's, and that's my overall point about this whole project. Is my overall objective is to show the world that Hispanic Catholics have a different relationship with ethnicity and the racism and, and with ethnicity in general, I would say. Mm -hmm. And the racism that we know is largely from the movies and from United States history. It's not Hispanic and it's not really Catholic. It's not Catholic. This document, the documentation defends, the documentation defense and incorporation of groups into the church, into Hispanicity reveals this single fact. It is not the same. There were no wars based on race in the Spanish Empire. Mm. The cat, the cat, um, they, it was not limiting. There were not limitations on people becoming uh, great nobles or elites in Spanish society. We have uh, many examples blacks, um, Native Americans uh, who were nobles recognized by the crown all throughout its history. Um, and also the mixing of the marriages, people marrying with each other, having children, uh, Catholic marriages at that, which is, you know, it's very sacred. It's Catholic society, Catholic 
it's you know you get one wife you know you get one for the rest of your life you know it's until the at least until death do you part right and you know your 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 lineage is recognized right it's you know <clears throat> you see even and even with Hernan Cortes is a good example too uh he had a child uh Ill, like a illegitimate child right with a uh, with his translator, um, La Malinche. Uh, she was a Native American woman that. Mm-hmm. Brought her in, he brought her, brought her along with everything and she helped unify the whole conquest and she uni- helped uh, translate to unify all the other neighboring tribes that hated the Mexica empire, hated the Aztecs. And uh, they had a child and she, she passed away of disease, but technically it wasn't in it through marriage. But he didn't abandon his child. No, his mestizaje, it did, the race didn't play a part in whether he loved his child or not. He brought his child to Spain and had the Pope recognize his child as, as a legitimate child to have his honors, even though he was, it wasn't through marriage. And right. then he went to, he, that child, Martin Cortez, became, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Um, what is it when the kids grow up together in, like little, in the same nursery home and they're like little children together, they're babies together in the same place? What's that called? Like your child, not a twin. twin um, when they're like, um, you know, like you know, in the same daycare, and you become friends, child right. friends almost. Yeah. Well, that that was him. Uh, Martin Cortez became a childhood friend with uh, the future King Philip II, who the Philippines is named after. Mm. So, like, I mean, t- this is high society. This is a mixed child, right? This is, uh, you know. This is Martin Cortez, and he ends up becoming a war hero in the Battle of Lepanto against the the Turkish Muslims, uh, against the Turkish Empire in the Great Sea Battle in the Mediterranean Sea, where they join forces with even France, a longtime opponent of Spain, and they join forces with the Italians, with, every, with the whole West, in order to to win this great back victory. And he was he was a war hero in this time. So yeah, anyways, that's my point about race, right? Is that there's all these, there's so much here, right? That just this, this new, this racism that we're seeing now, it's actually much more new than, it's much more modern than we know. It, um, so anyways, uh, let's see here. Where yeah, Matthew Powell it said, the- um, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Cuba, parts of Mexico, lots of native European blood that never wanted to interbreed with their native counterparts. I mean, is he trying to? I mean, if you if he wants to, I mean, if he wants to look at it, you know, we can we can go to the to the data in Cuba. There's in Cuba. There's a lot of mixing over there. In fact, the first right. black the first black cities were built in Cuba in uh, Saint Augustine. It was the first. Yeah, it was by these freed blacks, and I think that goes on to and then also a lot of mulattoes in Cuba. Actually, I just dropped a post about this actually the other day. It's funny he brought up Cuba, but the first mulattoes who are mixed. I mean, they're mixed people right off the back, free mixed people, free black people who who earn their 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 freedom either by paying off their paying off paying off for their own freedom or becoming sailors. And uh, this was common, especially in the Caribbean, because of how much how much transport was happening through boats and how many slaves were coming in that in that era. There was a lot of mixing in this time. And in fact, they weren't just freed. But there was literally the law that I posted it was Article 53 of the Ordinance of Cáceres and from 1573. Look how old this is. 1573. This law not only talks about the free black people that are there in large number because they're becoming so much that they're becoming neighbors, becoming port officials. But guess what? It's telling them to be armed. It's a right to arms. I mean, you don't give arms to people you distrust, right? These are great. These are great uh, free black men and mulatos, it says, too, which is, means they're mixed. This heavy segregation that, that is, it's a very United States of American thing. It's something that we're used to, that we're, we're charged with. It's not something that is on Hispanic Catholics. So anyways, <clears throat> um, let's see here. Where was I? So it is not the same. It is not the same. Uh, there, let's see, I say there were, no, there were no wars based on race. Um, not like how in the United States here, we've had, uh, wars against the Indians, you know, and there's literally like mm-hmm. in California, there was a call to exterminate the, Indi- the Native Americans, you know, but they said Indians. That's, and it's not, I'm not necessarily against that term too, because before this was the Americas, 
it was the West Indies, right? And you have East Indies and the West Indies. Um, this was the continent's name before. It was right. the Americas named after Amerigo Vespucci, who was a uh, mapper. Um, from... But anyways, that's besides the point. Uh, where was I? No, the lives of many mixed noble Catholics attest against this narrow-minded view. Therefore, not all Europeans were the same. Catholics are not Protestants. They're not Muslims. And these ideological and theological differences propelled Catholic Spain to take on an additional protective and excelling measures than any other classical empire, hundreds of years before the United States chose to do so. Eugenics, eugenics the science of racial supremacy among humans, is based on enlightened thinkers who were also enemies of the Catholic Church and of the Spanish Empire. Unfortunately, the United States has issued many eugenic programs and historically has pioneered these racist initiatives. That's where modern racism that divides people based on skin color derives from. The United States now is different than it was 100, even 50 years ago. That's undeniable. And I don't re recommend American citizens to turn their back on this country, their family, or their faith. In a time of identity crisis, which we're suffering a lot here in the United States, we need to recuperate our national identity and be because this is our home where we can be honest and strong Americans. As for me, I'm a Catholic Hispanic American, like other Americans of different colors and creeds. I defend where I come from and who I am. Oh, well, I'm just gonna read some comments here. Matthew Powell said the Eastern part of Cuba had lots of people who did not mix and he understands the whole island of mulatto. But growing up in Miami, there's more blue eyes, red hair Cubans than their counterparts. Interesting. And John says apparently he likes your tattoos and he is a wasp, <laughs> not a wasp. He's a wasp. I like that. <laughs> I love wasps. Catholic. And I, I feel, I feel kind of, and I, I respect John and I respect his family so much, you know, um, because like they don't, they, they got, t they got thick skin. You know, I think a lot of people, they would, I've seen other Catholics, you know, like, right. Yeah. Well, almost offended right because their english speaking side of them is almost like feels offended for you know of the things that i i have to say but i mean i'm just i talk about things that are that are his like these programs these eugenics programs like like i have videos on eugenics right like literally where it comes from and a lot of it comes from like darwinism's you know origin of species right, right. darwin's origin of species i mean these are not catholic views i don't they shouldn't be offended for these things it's and it's not like english it's attack on English genetics either because English England was a very strong Catholic country before it was appropriated by Protestantism. Mm -hmm. It's a very Catholic country right. deep down. Shakespeare's Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't, I don't see this affinity to this. And that's what I'm saying. It's, it's honestly, it's our racial, it's our racial, it's our racial. We're engineered to think so racially that, that we, when we, we assume that to talk about these things is an attack on white people, but it's not, it's not quite like that. Right. No, I agree. Miss Susan said, it seems we have been lied to concerning our history and the world. Thank you for helping share the truth. Thank you, Susan. God bless you. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add about the Black Legend <laughs> before we sign off? And maybe something, you know, we haven't covered. I know I've covered yeah. some pretty deep topics here. <laughs> so yeah, anything for real. else that you would like to like to just add? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'll just say to get this out of the way. Take everything with a grain of salt. If you hear something detrimentally scandalous, uh, don't believe it right away until you've done more research because it's probably misconstrued or accused inadequately. Uh, every day people go online and they spew lies and about Catholicism and Spanish history, and most of it's BS. Um, so that's that. Um, I, I, in my, the, the Spanish black legend, I'm working 24 seven on this stuff, right? Um, you know, I, it's, there's a lot, I mean, it's not just the inquisition. It's not just his, you know, Hispanics in the United States. Um, there's so much more. I would, there's, I talk about things like, um, like there was no genocide on native Americans by Hispanic Catholics in the American or in any discovered lands. There was no, honestly, they weren't, there's so little Hispanics Catholics coming to these areas that genocide is, it just doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. And then you start to see how much they incorporated themselves and they were friends. That's one thing too, right? Like, uh, it's like, I think Hernan, again, Hernan Cortes is another good example. 
Uh, have you ever heard that saying, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, Hernan Cortes was friends with a lot of these natives. He learned Nahuatl, the language. He governed these areas. Yeah, he was a man. He was a conquistador. He was ambitious. He was probably, he had to kill, right? It was a war. Um, and so were, were his friends and his allies, and all his Native American friends that he spent the rest of his life with too. So yes, there was slavery. Yes, these things existed, but these things weren't based on race. And so anyways, the um, and these things had been existing even before the Spanish even arrived. And that's another part of these social institutions that existed, right? So anyways, genocide, that's, Com it's just completely false. It's just even out of the question. Um, and if we start to get into some of the numbers too, so I think that's another thing I do too is I talk about the numbers, uh, even the diseases, how much how much population was even in the Americas, nobody really knows. And yet you have a lot of these studies with no archaeological evidence being completely unchallenged. And so that's some of the people I work with, some of these um, these these climatologists and some of the the historians are talking about this and they're calling it out and they're seeing when these numbers start to who are exploding these numbers and when it starts to take more explosion in history and and so I go over come things like that over I talk about the diseases right that's that's kind of related with the diseases and why these numbers are exploded because the more you exploit the, explode the numbers the more you can explode the diseases death count which d further demonizes right European in, uh, presence in the Americas. So, you know, it's got an agenda. There's a lot of agenda behind uh, these, you know, these groups. Um, so anyways, that's one. Another one is uh, stolen gold, right? Like uh, Hispanic Americans sometimes in uh, the, the pitiful oligarchs that they have at the moment, they'll start to point fingers at, at their Hispanic Catholic culture or their Hispanic Catholic history. And they'll start saying, that's why we're so poor. But there's a few issues. They, they, they were never always poor. In fact, when these independences happened, there were all these countries, a lot of these countries were the richest they'd ever been. Like Mexico City is a great example. Mexico City was far more wealthy than the United States upon its independence. Mexico City had more population in the first censuses of the 1700s. Um, these, th there was so much, there, we had the proto-industry that was happening at the time. In fact, Mexico City was more, even richer than Madrid, than the actual metropolis, the capital, right? Where the, where the crown is. They, they had, where they had more starvations in Madrid. And so, yeah, no, this hiccup, it doesn't make sense. You have the conquest, you have all this building, then you have this rise, and then you have the independence, you have, you have balkanization, you have people's brother, and then you see more fraternal side wars, fraternal side wars, all these brother countries fought, killing each other in large numbers, civil wars breaking out all throughout Hispanic America after the fall of the Spanish Empire, because this is the fall of a class, one of the last classical empire, like the Roman Empire, right? It's, it got that model, so it's so of course things have fallen apart since then, but it's not because of their culture, it's not because of their faith, it's not because of their Spanish language, and so sometimes they like to say, "Oh, they stole all our gold." That's one of the things they'll say: "They stole all our gold." Mm -hmm. That's wrong. No, the gold is very the gold that was actually taken to to the Spain the Spanish Peninsula was they said 180 tons generally, 180 tons. I'm sorry. I'm going. I'm ranting now. No, but, uh, go ahead. But, uh, I was reading yeah, yeah. Tons but no, no. I'm just. I'm just giving you the. I'm just giving you the numbers. I'm just giving you no, the numbers. So, anyways, like, because yeah, no, no. Basically, my point is, um, that's that's a good amount, right? 180 tons. Like, damn, that's that's a good amount of money, right? I would have like 180,000. Uh, 180 tons of gold back to my country. Yeah, no right? doubt. <laughs> but to, you know, but then you start to see that it's that's a very small a number of the gold that still is there in the Americas. And you start to realize that that's not all the gold that was extracted in that time period. And why does that matter? Well, you have 180 tons of gold, and that's not that's only what like seven percent, not 97 percent. That's that's one fifth of the gold that's being taken out at that time. So where's all the other gold? The other gold stayed in the Americas. It was invested. That's how they built cities. That's how they built hospitals. That's how they built cathedrals. That's how they they put it in the cathedrals. They put it in the places that mattered. The places for the well-being of their society. That's how they became so wealthy. They, they that's how they were able to get cattle, uh, you know, cattle ranches everywhere. People were paying. It was a, it was a working commerce. They worked. They so far they all, they all the way to Philippines. They were work. They that's how far this this empire went. And they commerce with China. And they were getting. That's how paper from China came came to to the Mexico for our day. Dia de los Muertos, our little ribbons that we have, comes from China because of this time period where we're commercing throughout the whole world. This is the first global empire. 
This is the first, no, this is the first, I'm sorry, not global. This is the first modern globalization, it, transatlantic globalization. And from the European peninsula to the Americas, to the Philippines, to and trans, and working with China. So anyways, yes, basically this, this matters, right? So, and then let's, let's really contextualize things. Let's really think. Okay, so there's this tax, the 180, right? That went to Spain. It's a tax. It's a tax. It's one fifth. We pay more than that in our taxes nowadays. We pay taxes on everything. Right. It didn't belong to Spain. This was Spain. This was the Spanish Empire. This didn't belong to it, like some kind of whipped, you know, slave. And that's how that's this was a this was a generative empire, as Gustavo Bueno has said. So, <clears throat> no, it's far more. It's there's a lot more to it, and I think. Um, the, the historian Juan Manuel Sunsunegui uh, said it really well when he's talking about the comparisons of Mexico, right? Mexico's gold. Um, and he said that basically in the 300 years of the vice regal era, meaning the Spanish era, right? Uh, in Mexico, the, the calculation, it says that there was 7% of all the gold of Mexico that we have of Mexico at the moment, right? That we've taken out of Mexico since, since, it's, since the conquest, right? It's, there was 7%, right? 7%. That's like nothing almost, right? And then you have of that seven percent, the fifth was taken out. That's even that's even less. That that was fifth that was taken to the crown. So the rest of it was invested, right? But then you start to ask, wait, if Hispanic America is poor, right? If they have these problems, right? Economical problems, well then what why aren't they doing why aren't they doing better? And that's that's on their they've been independent for like two hundred years. Well, that's that's on their own oligarchs that they've been they've they've had struggles with. That's on their debts that they that they got into with Great Britain in order to get these independences. A lot of people think these independences were a grassroots movements by the local population. They were not. Mm-hmm. No, they were middle class wealthy individuals who forced the civil war. And in fact, you start to realize the records. A lot of Native Americans fought for the crown. They defended the crown because the crown provided them rights rights that were quickly trumped as soon as they were as soon as the Spanish Empire had to leave. And so, and you even have uh, revolutionaries like uh, Zapata requ- asking the government, telling the government, because he, you know, he's a revolutionary against that government, the Mexican government, to provide the, the property rights to certain indigenous groups. And so, and, and, and according to the, the vice regal, the, the, the vice regal property rights, he's referencing Spanish property rights against the Mexican government. So, anyways, that's. And then we say, wait, 7%, right? They only took out 7% of Mexico, right? Makes you think, you're like, wait, wh- where's all this other gold? Well, guess what? All these other golds are being mined right now by private companies, private companies from the United States, private companies from Canada, private companies that are taking out more gold with more resources, more machinery than they ever could have in the past. And yeah, like for example, 180 tons, right? That's a lot. But guess what? In these same countries like Mexico, they took out like 120 tons in like 2015, the year alone. And you're like, whoa, or like in two years, right? It's you see how much they're taking down now is much, much heavier, much more. So yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. That this doesn't it there's a lot of black legend, there's a lot of myths, and I can I have to create just study, break them down one by one by one by one. But fortunately, right. I have the resources and I have the people to help me. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyway. Like your content's pretty much based around it, right? <laughs> Um, so it's very interesting because how I found you was with interviewing Mm -hmm. John the Catholic Brandex guy that uh, my people will see in the comment section and he mentioned Mm -hmm. uh, you know he's like have you heard the black legend I'm like the what you know like you don't really hear as like oh this is the black legend this is the white legend and this is what we believe you know what I mean but um, so that led me to like, so I watched his interview with you and then I was like, OK, he needs some he needs some harder questions. So I went and I'd done some research on it. And then mm-hmm. I come to find out that there's a lot of people, a lot of intelligent people like researching this and trying to say that there's some there's some myths here. And so that mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I got I got to interview you now. Like this, this is like beyond interesting, you know. So all of my questions were from these journal analysis that I had read, um, which is why they were a little bit deep, deeper in context, deeper in thought, which I enjoy. I like you know, if you want to learn something, we got it. We got to know it all, you know. <laughs> But um, so oh, trust me, I, I get I get challenged every day. I get crazy comments every day. I so bet. yes, 
every morning I wake up, every morning I wake up, there's somebody saying the wildest thing. So I get challenged. I'm like, oh, damn. So I really like your, I really liked your question. I appreciate it. I think you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So the title of this YouTube video is basically the black legend myth or fact. Can you answer that? Is it a myth or is it a fact? Or is it? Both? Oh no, it's a fact. <laughs> oh, it's a fact. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, there's so many, there's, I, I uh, recommend, uh, there's a book called uh, Imperiophobia y la Leyenda Negra. So it's called uh, Empire, Empire Phobia, right? People are scared of empires and, and uh, the black legend. And she gets, she goes to this woman, uh, Maria Elvira Roca. She's like in, she's in so many of our eyes. She's an idol. She's like a queen, right? She, we respect her so much. Um, but she gets into the the history, like the, the black legend has been studied since I want to say the early 1900s with mm -hmm. this author, Julian Juderias. Uh, he he was uh, he spoke multiple languages and he was able to realize that there was this quickly that there was this phenomena right where people were lying on the Spanish Empire and it's being believed right and then and then there's been multiple books in not just the Spanish speaking spheres but also in the the uh, English speaking realms and other European realms and the, the world has has been noticing and I mean these books came out some like uh, Philip Powell's Tree of Hate Henry Commons a uh, uh, book on I mean these are older books these are like in the seventies eighties. Right. So they've been around for a long time. So, I mean, it's been studied for a long time and and they're just. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, there's so much to it. It's it's so much. Yeah, it's obvious. It's, it's fact. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. So before we sign off, I want to go unscripted, go rogue. And I want to give you a challenge since we know the black legend is fact. Okay. Give me two sentences on what the black legend is. Just two sentences. <laughs> Again, two sentences. Uh, yeah. The Spanish, okay, hold on. The Spanish black legend are slanderous distortions regarding, slanderous distortions regarding history, Hispanic history based on exaggerations or false propaganda. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So sounds good. The Spanish black legend are slanderous distortions regarding Hispanic history based on exaggerations or false propaganda. Okay. There's there's a lot of to it, and there's there's stuff also too. There's um what we call uh, medias verdades, like half truths, right? Mm -hmm. And people get away with that too. They'll tell you, um, I think a good one, right? Is like there is forced labor, forced labor in Spanish society, right? And you're like, okay, there's some forced labor, yeah, but that's like half a truth, right? Because you realize that this forced labor had actually been happening even before the Spanish had arrived. That these these institutions carry Native American names, right? These these labels. Also, another one too is that um, like La Mita, right? La Mita is a Quechua word, right? So these pyramids, they weren't ha they weren't happy Arcadias where everyone was volunteering to to build themselves. No, this what the Spanish did is they they adopted a lot of these a lot of what was already here smartly, so too because why would why build everything from the ground up? Um, right. And then also another thing too is that a lot of this forced labor carried a lot of privileges and benefits. There's pay, there was days off, there was protect, there was uh, you know, there's uh, there's there was there was and it's all legislatively there. It's in the legislature. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of laws called uh, las leyes de las las leyes de las Indias, and it's hundreds of laws dating all the way back from the early 1500s, um, and they're regarding not just the work but all parts of life and just how things should be running smoothly, smoothly. Right. Truth, right? You also have omitted stuff, completely omitted stuff, accomplishments, right? I'm trying to think of one like that I can remember off the top of my head, but that's another, that's another way of, without lying, right? You give, you omit things. And mm -hmm. um, that, that's another way of, you know. Just kind of leaving getting, it you know, out. Yeah. Just because mm -hmm. you leave it out mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's really true, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you start, yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example for that, but I feel like I've talked to you off enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on and really, you know, telling us all about it. So thank you very much for your answers. You took a lot of time to answer this and it's a lot, so it's, it's a lot to take in in just an hour. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. God bless you, Jamie. Thank you so much for, for yeah. doing all this. Yeah. God bless you too. And I'll see everybody next time. Bye. Bye.